Greetings, travelers. Yes, it is time for another adventure of Eerie Travels. And special thanks to Destiny Beard for that awesome new intro. Very happy with it. Hope you all enjoy it. If you like her stuff, check her out, destinybeard.com. And uh, but more on that later. But right now, today's adventures are, um, I kind of have to give a little word of warning on this one. Now, we talk about a lot of dark history. We go to a lot of crazy places. We talk ghosts. We talk monsters. So this one, very much viewer discretion is advised because we're going to be talking about two uh, amazing castles in Florida swamps. Uh, you know, Florida swamp land, always fun. And uh, these two are no exceptions. These are quite literally legendary locations built by crazed geniuses. Now, the reason I gave the little word of warning is because they both have some odd stories to them. And then we're going to finish up with the king of the Florida skunk apes in a unique location that I think you're all going to love. So uh, some mad geniuses all around here. So, But uh, they are on that other level. So I think you're going to enjoy it. So stick with us. Well, our first location is quite literally in the middle of nowhere. It is in the town of Ona, Florida, which is about an hour south west of Tampa Bay. So you've got to go to Arcadia, which is probably the last big town before Ona, and then drive into nothing. You'll pass the infamous Bloody Bucket Bridge, which we'll talk about on a future episode. But you will get to the town of Ona, and there you will find the amazing Solomon's Castle. Now, Solomon's Castle was built by a man named Ed Solomon, who was this crazy artistic genius. And he was sold the swamp land in Florida, and found out he couldn't do much with it. So he decides to make the most of it. He starts, he's an expert in working with carving. He's an expert at working with stained glass, but he's also an expert at reworking things from recycled materials. So he decides to build a castle in his swamp. Now this castle uh, he jokingly said, you know, suddenly you build one turret, you build a second turret, you know, you got to build the rest of the castle. Uh, it's made all out uh, of recycled materials. So Howard Solomon built all this stuff. Now, the, the tin that you see on the sides of it is this recycled newsprint uh, machines from the Ocala newspaper, and it would print and print and print, and they would only be able to use them. And so they started selling them as ways to fix your sheds and all that. And so Howard, of course, picked them up for 10 cents a sheet. And that's how that castle has that shining outside. Now, the grounds themselves have tons of wildlife, tons of flowers, and it is a beautiful place to go visit. Inside the castle, we were not allowed to film but inside the castle is all of his art creations that he built over his life. And you can study these beyond belief. But he was a big pan fan of the pun. He was a pun slinger. And uh, infamously, his castle has lots of puns hidden in it. There are two suits of armor outside the front door. One is black, one is white. So those are the knight and the day. Uh, the guys with swords that all stand around outside look like a fence. They're called his fencing. Well, after he built the, uh, the boat, uh, uh, the, the castle, he decides to build a boat because he has this river going right through his swamp. And so he builds the boat in the moat. Uh, that became a restaurant because they were having so many guests. And uh, Howard never did anything by halves, as you can see. He didn't just build a small boat. He built a 30-foot Spanish galleon. Again, all made out of recycled materials. The cannons are old sewer pipes. The glass is stained glass that he made himself with that giant dragon and other stuff. 
And then on the other side, he decided, well, he needed a lighthouse. And because it's a lighthouse, he made it out of balsa wood. So it would be light. Uh, and there is a restaurant in the boat, and you can eat outside the lighthouse. They have frequently have live entertainment. It is this incredible location. And um, all in the middle of a swamp in Florida with no cell reception. Uh, they do have Wi-Fi. Uh, you can get married there. There are always events going on there. There is a chamber inside that you can stay in uh, for a small fee. The family itself still runs the grounds and gives the tours as Howard did up until his untimely death just a few years ago. And it's amazing. The tour is full of puns. There's infamously this one board in there that he has all these carved dinosaurs on. He said he wanted to build Jurassic Park. He couldn't afford it, so he built Jurassic Plank. Uh, the stained glass generally has medieval or zodiac or astrological meanings. It's, it's just incredible. The stuff inside, I wish we could show you, but it is well worth your trip to Ona. Uh, make your day trip anywhere in Central Florida, this is where you want to go. Go to their website, solomonscastle.com, and that's Howard there. And uh, book your trip, book your, you know, you can reserve tickets. Uh, you can go visit the castle for free, but to go into the castle to see the exhibits, you have to pay for the guided tour, and you can go eat at the restaurant and have a grand time. One of my favorite places there is the restrooms. He made it out of an old rooms to go sign. That's the kind of level of fun you're going to get there. Uh, they made a, a band that he had made entirely out of tuna cans. So he called them uh, the, uh, the, the, the Sum Enchanted Tuna or the Alta Tunas. And uh, they're playing Flight of the Bumblebee because of Bumblebee Tuna. So you know, great little stuff like that. So definitely worth a fun visit into the middle of nowhere, Florida. Now. Howard's family, as I said, still run the place. They weren't sure what to do once he passed away, but because response was so amazing and so many people remember going there, they have kept it open. They've also opened a second feature there, which is his classic car collection that you can go visit. And we didn't get much footage of that because it was closed the day we went, but uh, that you are allowed to film in and he has tons and tons of vintage cars and some of his unique creations that he made out of recycled parts from cars to make his own vehicles, which again, what a, what a mad genius, we love it. So our next location is a little more infamous. You go further south and you go to the town of Homestead. Now, this town is the current home of one of Florida's earliest tourist attractions. Its origins shrouded in mystery. It was infamously depicted on an episode of Leonard Nimoy's In Search Of. And this place is still there. It is still quite an amazing feat built by another one man. This was built by a man named Edward Leeskin. And he was five foot two, five foot three, weighed less than 100 pounds. And he was marching along through the south roads of Florida in the 1920s. And a man driving along saw him, picked him up, and they became fast friends. And he told him, I don't have a penny to my name. I'm an immigrant from Latvia. I'm looking for land. I have to build something. And I'm looking for special land. So. His friend took him in, realized he had very advanced tuberculosis, but nursed him back to health with his lovely wife. And they helped this crazy man with his bike, and they, he kept riding around town. He became kind of a character in South Florida, and he was looking for that perfect land. And finally, on his friend's property, he says, I've found it. And what he took him to was out in the middle of nowhere, was land that was useless for farming. It was all bedrock up to the surface. There was barely any topsoil. What was he going to do with this land? He's like, no, this is what I want. So he gave it to his friend, and he left. 
few days later, he was curious what was going on. And he comes to the land. And there, his friend has this 10-ton block of coral, perfectly cut, hanging on a pulley. And how did this little guy do all this by himself? And this is the time before Model T's. You know, what, what the heck is going on? How did this man do this? Well, they leave him alone, and then a few days later, he's built more and built more, and he builds what is now known as Coral Castle. Now, Coral Castle is sometimes called the eighth wonder of the world. It is all built by one man, 30 tons of coral built into these giant structures, and he lived there all alone for years, saying he was building it for his sweet 16, his, his dream girl who would come visit him at some point. Now, all these carvings, he was not a skilled artisan, as many knew, but he built these amazing carvings. He quarried tons of coral. Uh, he built tributes to the stars and the moons, and people would come visit him. He built a sundial that is accurate to this day. He has a telescope that is accurate to the North Star and Polaris. He had a 10-ton door right there that you could move with one hand. And it pivoted with, with ease. There's the heart-shaped uh, table for his Sweet 16. He built a table shaped like Florida even put Lake Okeechobee in it as a little, it's a bird bath now, but that was so you could wash your hands when you came for dinner. All the chairs were rocking chairs built out of 10 ton stone. And there's the quarry that he dug it all up in. It's quite extraordinary. Now, people asked him, how did you do this? He would only work at night. When anyone would come to visit, he would stop working. You could not see him build at all. He would not let anybody see. So there were strange stories that he had uh, could talk to the stones and, and make them move. There are strange stories that uh, he was an inventor uh, with electricity and he was coming up with ways to reverse gravitation. And that's how he could move the stones. Well, to be fair, Ed did all this over 30 years of his life. If he had the power to move stones with his mind, I think he would have probably built it in about two weeks. Now, not saying he wasn't a genius, it's incredible. Look at those stones, they're there. And his greatest feat was one night he was robbed at his castle and he panicked and decided he was too close to you know, danger, so he moved the entire coral castle on the back of a friend's pickup truck, the 30, 300 tons of stone by this time, he moved them on a flatbed truck all by himself. He wouldn't let the man see how he loaded the stones. He loaded them himself. The man was a master of pulleys and gears. There are photos of him using it. Sadly, his 10-ton door no longer works. It was blown off its hinges by Hurricane Andrew. Uh, they were able, though, then to see how he'd engineered it, and he had balanced it perfectly on an axle from a Model A truck, and uh, they still have been unable to replicate it. Now, it's right now off of old US-1. That's when he started charging a fee to let people come see his place, and uh, he would give you tours of the place up until one day he checked himself into a hospital, he was not doing well. They were so surprised by his malnourishment. And uh, he passed away a few days later. His sweet 16 never came to see the castle he had built for. But I think it's just a tribute to what one man can do. It's, it's crazy. It's, it's huge. The, one of those stones alone is 30 tons and is over, 12, uh, uh, over uh, 20 feet tall. So how this guy, five foot nothing, weighing less than 100 pounds, managed all this with pulleys and stuff is still quite a testament. Uh, paranormal researchers and other stuff have gone there many a night trying to catch the ghost of Ed Leeskin. Um, it's on a major street, so it is a little tricky to see. 
They generally don't allow filming there when you go. Um, you are allowed to take all the photos you'd like. Uh, they also recommend that you call ahead to book a tour. Uh, you are only allowed to be in the castle, supervised. They don't want anybody climbing on the rocks. There has been degradation. Up until recently, people could climb and sit on those rocking chairs and do all these things. Um, but you know, the, the place needs to be saved and needs to be protected. So it is quite an accomplishment. And it shows you just amazing how much one man can make a difference in the world. So another mad genius for us here. Now, when he died, it was uh, tuberculosis had finally claimed him, but it was 20 years, or I'm sorry, 30 years later. Uh, but you can go visit there, and uh, it costs more than 10 cents now, but it's still a lot of fun. Now, our last thing, we've had a lot of requests already because we are based in Florida, and everybody knows we love our cryptids. I'm going to talk about the great creature of Florida, the skunk ape. Florida loves to rename things. We can't call anything what everybody else calls it. We have a strange creature that swims in the St. John's River that nearly stank, sank a steamship. And do we call it the Beast of St. John's? No, we call it Pinky the Sea Monster because it's the color of boiled shrimp. There's a beast in Barden that is a giant that uh, has scared a woman off a horse and has chased people for decades. We call him not the Beast of Barden, we call him the Barden Booger. Those are for future episodes. Florida has its own Sasquatch. And our Sasquatch all over the state has been called everything from the wild man to Bigfoot to Sasquatch. But most affectionately, he is known as the skunk ape because they generally live in swamps and they generally smell terrible. That's the name that's stuck. It's with us forever and ever and ever. And there is only one man who is the definitive expert on skunk apes. Now there are lots of skunk ape groups and there are lots of skunk ape hunters. I love them all, they are all fantastic in their own way, but the pioneer who's been doing it longer than anybody is the great Dave Sheely. And he's down in Everglades City, so along Alligator Alley after you leave Coral Castle and on your way back to the Gulf Coast, you can go to the Skunk Ape headquarters, and there you will find Dave's unique store and his campgrounds on his property. Now, Dave infamously recorded some footage on his property in the year 2000, and it is up there with the Patterson-Gimlin film from the 1960s on what did we film. It's been studied almost as much. Now, it's not often mentioned in the same breath, but as you can see, this is on the edge of his property, and he's filming out, and this is pure swamp. Now, most skunk ape videos, Bigfoot videos, are gone after a minute. You know, you, you watch a few seconds, and then somebody suddenly it cuts out. Now, this is still 2000, so this is pre-cell phones, uh, you know, video. This is on a camera uh, that he was able to grab when he saw the thing. Now, that area out there is water, that is swamp, that is not grass. So this creature is walking through deep alligator, snake-filled water, and he uh, is trying to follow it, loses it here for a second, but there it is again, and, he's, and it's moving, not like you'd think somebody in a suit would move through, trudging through water, especially not in a fur-covered suit. Um, and uh, he's able to keep on it pretty steady, uh, which is another one of those reasons why this footage is considered, you know, something questionable. What did he see? This thing is moving at pace. And anybody else walks out there, you're going to get, you know, drowning, uh, you know, after a few feet because that water is so deep. Uh, you know, it would be up to my knees and I'm six foot. This thing's a little bit taller than that. You know, some people have suggested it's on stilts, you know, guy in a fursuit. Still, that's a lot of swamp land to cover, and if it was a hoax, I think it would have been a lot shorter. Dave's footage is quite possibly, in my opinion, one of those that just like 
stands out. I mean, obviously, our skunk apes are not big and hairy like Patty. This is definitely leaner and meaner and uh, looks more orangutan-ish the way it runs. But look at this. It, when it takes off, when it sees him, that's running at speed. That's through swampland. It's not slowing down at all. That's the part that I think is eerie. It's and then into the trees, and he loses it. There's more footage, but it, it, there's nothing. He can't follow it. So now he's standing at the edge of his property there as he's looking out onto the 40 acres that he has there when he catches that. That is now campground, and you can go stay there, and you can you know launch your own skunk ape investigations. Now Dave himself it will be happy to talk to you there. He has a nice little zoo there. Uh, the shop itself is mostly for camping supplies, but it has, of course, skunk ape shirts and skunk ape materials. But it also has skunk ape hot sauce and skunk ape barbecue sauce, which I picked up. Uh, and the snake there, one of the snakes there, her name is Goldie, and she is a reticulated python, and she is currently the second largest snake in the world. Now, Dave is convinced that Goldie is going to be the largest snake in the world soon. They had a big event with Ripley's Believe It or Not and uh, the Guinness Book of World Records there trying to measure her, but she was being a little ornery that day. And so, uh, you know, performance anxiety, we all have that. Uh, and uh, so she wasn't quite up to her full length. But as you can see, the shop itself, unique items, incredible place to shop. Um, and then you can go in and see the animals for a small fee and take a look at Goldie. And then he's got other animals there. He's got some alligators that he is, uh, you know, part of the conservation efforts. And they've got just all the camping supplies you can possibly need while you're there. They have some rustic cabins that you can stay in. They also have uh, some campsites where you can plug your RV or, you know, put, pitch your tent. Uh, they have other, you know, locations as well uh, that uh, are all available to uh, look through and all that. So it's pretty amazing the stuff you can find in this little shop. Uh, sadly, they didn't have our book that day, but they do have some great books on skunk apes written by some of the other great Florida authors and some of the other Florida experts, uh, including footage of Dave with his alligators and uh, some of his other locations he's find. Uh, one of my favorite things is an ask watch there. And Harry, or our Florida movie, Harry and the Hendersons, uh, filmed up at Universal Studios up in Orlando. But we have a quick interview with Dave that we're gonna play. Well, welcome to Skunk Ape Research Headquarters. I'm Dave Sheely and we got a lot going on here at the research headquarters. We do canoe and kayak rentals. We've got lodging. We've got the second largest snake in the world and a little gift shop, camping and motor homes and tents. We just, we do a lot here. The one thing that we do best is we give information about the skunk ape, the people that come in and ask. And um, I've got some tracks here that I've collected in a preserve. But, you know, it's, it's tough when you live out here in the middle of the Everglades. It, it really is. Um, spent my whole life out here researching skunk apes. Not a whole lot of support, you know. And then, you know, you, you got to make a living. So you, you know, this was my idea how to make a living, and it's working. But people hold that against me. They're like, "He's making money off the skunk ape." I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm making a living surviving in the Everglades and my skunk ape research has nothing to do with that. So a very misunderstood for many many years. I'm looking forward to speaking at the Florida Skunk Ape Conference in Ponta Gorda on June the 4th and I'm hoping to see a lot of people there sporting a skunk ape t-shirt. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> so now you're, you're probably most famous for that footage. When was yeah. that? The video that was taken in 2000, and it was in July of 2000. It was a it was a wet year. There's a lot of water on the ground. So if you get a chance to see that video, it's walking down that tree line. The reason it's walking down that tree line because that's higher ground. That's uh, uh, that's pine trees there. 
so it's not as wet there but when it gets down to the end of those pines and cuts out across the marsh it's running as fast as a deer and there's a foot and a half two foot of water in that area so keep that in mind and if you've got a real good system and you can kind of zoom in on it when it really starts to take off you'll see the water splashing up above its head i mean it's definitely in the water and it's moving fast yeah it's incredible footage and uh thank you so much for having us out we're going to take a look at some of the animals and uh and we're going to drive through your wonderful campground but uh, thank you again and if they want to find you online where do they find you uh, skunk ape headquarters skunk ape dot info is the best that okay. goes direct direct to the headquarters here all right awesome thank you so much dave it's a pleasure so You're welcome mark so thanks dave for having us down there uh Tolumpian with other geniuses of South Florida, I had to put you in, man. So that was amazing. We love your place. We love your location. And he and I will both be speaking at the Southwest Florida Bigfoot Conference in June in Punta Gorda. That may be his last time public speaking. So definitely get your ticket soon. It is going to sell out. Southwest Florida Bigfoot Conference. And for those of you joining us, visit his shop down there. And we will see you all next week. Enjoy your travels.